And the fire of life is not someplace you want to be all on your own. We've got to recognize and appreciate the value and the importance of keeping our edge, staying sharp. Sharp spiritually, sharp mentally, staying aware of the little nuances of life that try to come in and create opportunities and avenues for us to get dull, to get complacent. Well, it's just one show. Well, it's just one this. Well, it's nobody will know. You're right. It doesn't matter if anybody ever catches you or not. Sin will destroy you and nobody will ever know you have it. The problem with sin is not that you got caught. The problem is the separation it creates between you and your father God. Everybody in Israel suffered because Samson was a womanizer. Because he could not control his flesh. Everybody suffered. He was supposed to deliver them. Instead, they were all staying in bondage. What I want to do this morning is, and you know, we summarized a lot more there, and I ran out of time. But today, what I want to do is I want to take that same principle that we saw, and the importance of abiding in Christ, and the importance of recognizing the importance of not becoming dull in our spiritual walk. And I want to bring that same understanding over into the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, we begin today by seeing what happened in Samson. In the Old Testament, Paul begins to reveal in Romans chapter 1 why that happens. And I think it's important for all of us to learn these four things because they are so important because many of us are not going to grow long hair and get a Delilah and tear down gate walls and kill thousands of people with bones from animals. We're just living life, working our job, married with kids, and we can't relate oftentimes to the reality and the bigness of Samson's story to the uniqueness of our own self. It sounds great, it's so obvious, but what does that got to do with me? How do I apply that to me? And I believe what happens here in Rome, in Romans chapter 1, is Paul is beginning to show and lay a foundation. Now you've got to have some context about the book of Romans. Romans, obviously it's a church in Rome. Paul did not found this church in Rome, but Paul knew of and had a relationship with the man who did find it. In Acts chapter 2, you see a little blip about how there were visitors from Rome who were Jews and proselytes. Those people came to Jerusalem, heard the word, learned, and went back and started a church in Rome. Paul's intent when he wrote Romans was to eventually go to Rome, visit this church, and then go on and and proselyte Spain. Of course, that didn't happen because he was arrested. But So this letter is different. Because he's not writing to churches that he's apostled and been there. So there's a a lacking of personal um, conversation in the letter. See, in a lot of other Corinthians, Ephesians, he's writing to particular things. You've got a guy in your church who's sleeping with his mom. Like, he's talking about specific issues. He doesn't do that in Romans because he's never been there. What he's doing, and I think is so important about the book of Romans, and in all of your daily devotions, you need to incorporate Romans into your studies. Because Romans lays out a very theological basis for our belief system. He talks about righteousness, he talks about salvation, he talks about grace, and how grace is not free, it was paid for and provided in Christ. There is a lot of foundational understanding of Christianity in the book of Romans. I've been working through my father's series on Romans and making it my own. I'm going to steal it because he won't mind. But uh, it's so deep, I can't figure out how to break it down without it taking like two years. It's just so meaty, every verse, every verse, every verse, but I'm going to get there. But the reality is, is in Romans, it's critical. So here, he begins the book of Romans in chapter 1, laying a foundation of understanding. And I think this is important. I've had this question to me several times. And he says here, in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, he says, For since the creation of the world... God's, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. See, we, we have this under attack today. It was natural selection. It was, you know, the big bang that created. And here we're being told, no, 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 come on. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everyone has some sense of a God. It is clearly understood that everything was made by some eternal power. Now, they might not agree on what God that was. It may not be the God of Jehovah, but it is a God. There is something that it created. There's always that, well, who did that? All right, well, the Big Bang, well, who created that? Well, who, you know, you know that argument. We've all had it with somebody. The reality is, is here, God is laying this idea that, listen, don't be fooled. Everyone has some clear understanding that there had to be an eternal power that created everything, a Godhead. Now, listen, this doesn't mean everybody's saved. You have to come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Christ to be made a new creation. We're not talking about you're saved because everybody clearly knows we're, that we're saved because there's a God. No, that's not true. He's laying a foundation that, first of all, let's get away from this idea nobody knows who God is. Well, what about the poor guys in Africa? They even know there's a God. They might not know our God, but they know something created this. They might worship it in a way that we would not agree with, but in their mind they understand there is a God. This is important to understand. This is important to the theology of our belief system, that everybody has some natural understanding. Just because of all the attributes that may seem invisible to us, we don't know how it was created, but it's here, and nothing just came out of nothing. This is important. He's he's laying this foundation. Not that everybody is saved, but that everybody has an understanding of a God. Okay, and then in verse 21, which is our text this morning, he gives us four things that people begin to do that deaden themselves spiritually to an awareness of God. And I believe in verse 21, he starts to define those who believe there is a God in general and those who now become aware of that God on a personal level and then they don't reply or respond in the right way. He says this, although they knew God, in the, in the New King James, it says, knew God. But over in the Amplified, it says, they knew and recognized him as God. So now it's changing that person who knows there is an in, in, in an invisible way a creator. But now he says, no, 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 that person becomes to where he now recognizes and knows the God. So now they're believers in God. Now they have an understanding of who God is. From a biblical or a spiritual sense. Are you following me? He's laying out that there's a big picture. And then they come to know this God. Now they recognize him as God. But watch this. They keep acting like the old man. They do not glorify him as God. Nor are thankful. But become futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Look at that. I can come to know and recognize God and still think, behave, and have something happen to me that is a spiritual sensitivity that is lost. A a separation from what I knew and recognized as God and recognized it working in me. See, I I can know God. I'm a Christian, but I cannot glorify Him. I'm not thankful. My thoughts are futile and my heart is darkened. Knowing and recognizing God. See, we think, well, I got saved when I was 10. That don't mean you guaranteed to to walk in, to live in, to be uh, applicable to the promises of God's word. Salvation is an experience, a moment. You got to build on that. It's not a once and for all. So many people spend their whole life, what the Bible calls babies, infants, in the spiritual things of God. They never grow. Church never grows them. Church never pushes them. Church never tries to mature or disciple. We spend our whole ministry preaching salvation and getting people saved. And we do it about 50 different ways. But the message is all the same. That's great. But somewhere I got to grow. I got to mature. I got to get past recognizing God. And now I got to see God working in me. And here Paul is pointing out why that doesn't happen. 
There are specific behaviors that need to be happening in our life to keep us sharp, to keep us with an edge, to keep us from becoming dull, to keep us from being so unaware of God in our life that when He departs, we don't even recognize it. I know these are hard sermons to hear. I'd much rather just preach on how you should feel good and be better and Jesus loves you. But the reality is, is you will not grow up on that diet. It's just a milk of the Word. Somewhere, the meat of the Word is going to have to be digested. You know, if I eat a big old steak about 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I'm still up digesting it. It's doing something to me. You know what I mean? It's not just going down and coming out. The Word has meat to it, has weight to it, and it's gonna, that's what's going to mature and grow you. So it's going to maybe not feel good to the flesh, but if you'll hear what God is saying today, if you'll die to self and be sensitive to where you are in this thing, where am I in my walk with the Lord? Are any of these applicable to me right now in my life? Then this message is for you. Romans Chapter 1, number 1, begins to tell us the first thing that spiritually deadens people to the awareness of God is they quit glorifying Him as God. They know Him as God, they recognize Him as God, but they stop glorifying Him. If you want to become dull, if you want to lose a spiritual awareness of God, stop glorifying Him as God. Well, you know, maybe that's not good for today. Well, maybe that that didn't mean that in the Bible. When we start watering down what God is and what He has said in His principles and His Word, when we start diluting it for compromise, then we stop doing what God here is telling us. We're not glorifying. We glorify Him as God. We don't glorify Him as our opinion of God. What I want God to be in this situation, I'll glorify that. No, we have to glorify God as God. That means we take Him for all that He is, like it or not. And we accept it. And we glorify Him for that. We don't try to compromise that so that other people can accept it. We glorify Him as God. The word glorify means to worship Him as God. This morning we were worshiping God in this building. In that moment, that is what glorifying God is. Now some of y'all were doing this the whole time. Some of y'all sat in the chair. Some of y'all on your phone. I was back there watching you. I shouldn't have been. But I thought, I'm going to watch because I'm preaching on it. Most of you were glorifying God. You were worshiping God. Some of you were watching us do it. It doesn't rub off. You're not lumped in because everybody else is. You are. God is looking at you and your heart. And let's just stop and think. Let's reverse it. Let's say today we were all here to glorify you. And you were standing up here, and each one of us were standing out here singing and worshiping you. And we were doing it like this. We were doing it in the chair. We were doing it while watching our phone, looking around, scratching our head. How would you feel standing here being glorified with the people doing it like that? Hey, thanks for watching. Make sure you click like and subscribe to this channel so you can catch all our videos and live streams. Hey, why don't you share one of these videos with your friends? And remember, you can catch me live every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. Thanks for watching. This is our finest hour to set men free.